a member of the church family at St. Luke's, and I'll be uh, leading us through our time together. If you're new to St. Luke's online or in the building, we're so pleased that you've uh, joined us today. Uh, do uh, introduce yourselves afterwards if you're in the building or make contact with us. Um, following announcements uh, later, there'll be a time for our uh, youth and children uh, to go to their activities. But if you have very young children, um, we have a creche in the Lambert Hall, which you may use at uh, any time at all. So as we start our time together, I'll now uh, lead us in a prayer. Let's pray. From Philippians 2. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Help us, Heavenly Father, to know your love today as your rescued people through your greatest gift, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, we'll start our time together. Please refer to the service sheet and the Bible during your time here today. We start with our first song, How Great Thou Art. Please stand when the music starts. Take a seat. Well, in our last song, verse 3, we sang together, When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation to take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Our loving God is both a creator and in the Lord Jesus provides salvation 
and a home for us in heaven. We receive God's grace uh, through confessing sins, turning and putting our trust in the Lord Jesus. Until that day of Jesus' return, however, we continue to sin, to mess up, to turn away from God and ignore him and push him away. There's an opportunity in the moment to confess our sins together. So let us recall those things in the past week that we've done wrong, things we'd like to say sorry for. And then, after a few moments of silence, please join me in the words of the confession on page one of your sheet. We say together, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, in the Bible, we can read these comforting words from Psalm 32, verse 5. Then I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus as our Redeemer and King, to take the punishment for sin that we deserve to bring us back to you. In his glorious name we pray. Amen. Well, Josh will now bring us our church family news. Let me add my welcome to Mark. It's really lovely to see you this morning. If we haven't met, my name's Josh. I'm on the staff team here, and it'd be great to catch up uh, afterwards over coffee. Um, just a few things to draw your attention to. You can see uh, the news and diary there on the back of the service sheet. Uh, lots of things restarting uh, in a couple of weeks after, in a week after um, our Easter holidays. Um, particularly, just to note that on um, Wednesday, uh, this coming Wednesday, it's our church prayer and praise evening. Uh, there's a great chance for us to uh, sing together. We sing a couple of songs together um, and then we uh, pray in small groups around tables for some chosen topics uh, that we're given a bit more of information at the front and then we get to pray together for a few minutes um, in uh, small tables. It'd be great to see as many of you there as possible. It's a really encouraging and um, uh, I find it a really encouraging event to be at every month, so looking forward to seeing you there on Wednesday. Um, secondly, we do have a church email list that we send out uh, information and um, uh, regular updates and things like that, particularly also things like the service sheets for Sundays, a reminder of what's happening. Um, and we know that lots of people are not on that. If you would like to be on that email list, please do talk to Sarah um, and she'll get you on that list. Um, uh, do speak to that. Also, we do have a WhatsApp as well. If you would like to be on the WhatsApp, um, do speak to me. Um, thirdly, there are no kids groups this morning. Um, sorry, Mark. <laughs> but there are no kids groups this morning. We're all staying in, but the creche is still running. Uh, the unmanned creche is still running there away. Um, my left, your right. Um, and lastly, very excitingly, we have two birthdays this morning. We have two birthdays this morning. Uh, Joseph, who is... Right there, there we go, super, Joseph and Olivia, um, it's two birthdays, so we'll do Joseph and Olivia as we sing, so let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday Joseph and Olivia, happy birthday to you. Let's give them a round of applause. And hand back to Mark. Thanks very much indeed, Josh. So we uh, then turn to our second song, uh, We Belong to the Day. Please do stand when the music starts. Thank you. Oh, 
to the day, to the day that is to come, when the night falls away, and our Savior will return, for the glory of the King is in our hearts. On that day we will be seen from what we are. We belong to the day. Let us journey in the light, put on faith, put on love, as our armor for the fight, and the promise of salvation in our eyes. On that day the proud will fall, the faithful will rise. Strong as a mighty rock, our refuge in the coming wrong. in the coming wrath. The heart of the bride belongs to Jesus, Jesus. The earth in its turning stops to marvel at the Son of God. And all of that day belongs to Jesus, Jesus. And all of that day belongs to Jesus, Please do sit down. Well, it's an enormous privilege, isn't it, to have uh, God's Word, the Bible, in our hands. Um, in a moment, John's going to come up and give us our reading today, and then uh, John will, uh, sorry, Juan will explain it to us. Today's reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. It's on page 3 of the Church Bible. If you've got that ready, well, I'm ready. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, John. Now, another John steps up. That's my name, Juan, in Spanish. It's John, of course. Good morning to you all, and uh, good morning on this second Sunday of Easter. 
The Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. During this term, we, um, we're, we're going to change. We were previously in Romans, and we're going to jump to Genesis. One of, uh, oh, that's not the right sheet. Let's see. Uh, one, of, one of the reasons we're moving to Genesis is because some Christians have never looked at it. All of us, however, can, can look at Genesis and see how it applies to our living in the here and now. This book is over 3,500, 4,000 years old. It applies to the here and now. Genesis 1 is proof that God invented baseball. In the big inning. <laughs> if you'll forgive for a minute the terrible pun, the big inning of Genesis is where we learn so much about this game of life. I can see it now. Maybe you can see it. The stadium is dark. The lights come on. The home team goes out onto the field, the pitch. Our star player, Adam, steps up to the bat, and he's hit. In the very first pitch, bowl for you cricketers. Very first pitch, he's hit. He goes down. Our team will never be the same. Our team descends into chaos. But we learn in Genesis that there's a player deep in the lineup who will come. Much later in the game, he'll come. He will win the game, and the crowd will go wild. That's Genesis, in a nutshell. Genesis begins with the end in mind and has a unique explanatory purpose. Genesis has some of everything. It's a book of prologue, poetry, prophecy, and promise. The purpose of Genesis is not simply as an origin story, although that's certainly included. Genesis 1 through 2 stands alone in the world of ancient religious texts and creation myths. It's not a myth, it's true. It's not like the myths in that it's not a song, it's not poetry, not exactly. According to scholars like Gordon Wenham, who have properly studied the ancient Hebrew and other near ancient, uh, uh, ancient Near East uh, texts, most of Genesis 1 is elevated prose, high-flying language that uses poetic devices and literary frameworks. These, of course, beg the question, how should we read it? How are we to read this elevated prose, because it is prose, it should be read as history, but because it has these rhyming devices, these structures that encapsulate ideas within patterns, it should be read expansively, not in pure metaphor or symbolism, but as historical fact with a simultaneous drawing back of the curtain, as it were, to glimpse the divine. Genesis purports in its literary structure and the directness of its tone to, to be telling us the truth. It's a truth that likely does not fit into our presupposed categories of experience. And so I offer you another prologue for comparison. You'll recognize this pretty quickly. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Now let's ask some inappropriate questions of half of Shakespeare's prologue. Are Romeo and Juliet really from the stars? Do their parents' loins forebode their death? How can households have dignity whilst blood is on their hands? Do you see that my questions demand answers of this prologue that it does not possibly intend to give? And we can often come to Genesis and read it for things that it does not want to give us, demand answers of it that it doesn't intend to show us. Shakespeare intentionally mashes up good and evil, high, low, love, hate, order, and chaos in order to expand our categories Amidst the squalor of 16th century London, he wants to lift the eyes of the playgoer's heart to behold the sight of true love. 
And I tell you this morning that more important than anything else in Genesis is God's love. It is a love story. So in this first inning, the big opener of the game, we find that the beginning is pregnant with the end. So let us pray as we open God's word. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, maker of the heavens and the earth, let your spirit by your good will so inhabit this place this morning that our minds and hearts would be filled with your greatness, drawn to trust you, and inspired to live most fully through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Paul, uh, I'm sorry, wrong page. The title of this sermon is Look and Look Again. Some of you will recognize that from Pilgrim's Progress. It's a quote that's floated around here recently. And accordingly, here's what I propose we do this morning. We look at these first five verses of Genesis we look at the text, we look at its structure, we look at its abstractions, we look at its content. And then I propose that we look again with a view to how Jesus completes and fulfills this story, this first day of creation. Printed in your uh, insert in the service sheet are five points for this sermon, one for each verse, and you'll notice that each one of them begins with God. That's no accident. God is mentioned 35 times in the first chapter of Genesis, 35 times in less than as many verses. That tells us that the subject of Genesis 1 is God. We often come to the first chapter of the Bible and we think that the subject is creation. The subject is God telling us about his creation. So first point, God is all-powerful and creative. In the beginning, first thing we see is there was a beginning. We'll leave that at that. In the beginning, God. So God is there in the beginning. Did God begin in the beginning? No. He was there. He was already there, eternally existing. He was there in order to create. Now, creativity, the American author Mark Twain famously said, there's no such thing as a new idea. It's impossible. We simply take a lot of old ideas and put them into a sort of mental kaleidoscope. Scientists call this combinatorial creativity. Boy, that's a mouthful. Recombining ideas in a way that is new. This is, of course, why education matters, because the more you know, the more that you can connect previously unconnected ideas. But there are other kinds of creativity where problem solving are involved or where spontaneous uh, acting or music playing or, uh, or where deliberate tool making, product design come into play. There are other types of creativity. For humans, this is almost always a curious mix of emotion, cognition, deliberation, and spontaneity. We usually have a reason to be creative, and it takes being in a playful frame of mind to find creativity. Not so with God. Consider that he created, he made ex nihilo, that is, out of nothing. He had no problems to solve, no goals to achieve. He created out of sheer abundance and out of the overflow of his own super self-satisfied nature. Now what did he create? He created the heavens and the earth. This is more than just the sky that we look at. It is all of the things beyond the sky. It is said that the observable universe is 93 billion light years across. I don't know about you, but I can't begin to fathom how large that is. It stands to reason that if God made all there, he is indeed a powerful and creative God. 
Is this mic okay? It's, yeah, it's, it's going out, isn't it? Um, our second point, God's spirit is present over chaos. Now, now the earth, verse 2, um, if we look at verse 2, a qualifying statement. The first verse says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void and darkness covered the surface of the deep. It's a qualifying statement. What it does is set our vantage point from planet earth, almost like in fair Verona. From this vantage point, we're told that Earth was a dark planet, perhaps a swirling of of mass and energy of atoms and molecules shrouded in mist and water. In short, it was chaos. Verse 2 describes it in a rhyme. The Hebrew words there rhyme, tohu and bohu, formless and empty. These twin words are used in other places in the Old Testament, in Isaiah and Jeremiah, to describe impending judgment they, they convey a baseless or futile condition locked in a context of chaos. Now darkness was over the surface of the deep. In ancient creation myths, the sea was personified as chaos. That's not quite what's happening here, although Genesis 1 does exist in that theme. Darkness is over the surface of the deep. There's a deep chaos happening here. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The verb found here is repeated in Deuteronomy 32.11, and it evokes the image of a mother bird hovering over her brood. And the Spirit of God is first in. The first action God takes, says Charles Spurgeon, the preacher, the famous preacher, in preparing this planet to be the abode of man is for the spirit of God to move within it. Verse three, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God speaks, and when he speaks, it happens. He has only to speak the word and great wonder is accomplished. What is this wonder? It's light. Is this light the sun, which is made in day four later in Genesis? Perhaps, there are varying explanations here. Derek Kidner, the Old Testament theologian from Cambridge, postulates that on day four, the clouds were pulled away and the sun was seen from the vantage point of earth from fair Verona. It is also possible, as Swiss theologian Karl Barth pointed out, that the light that here precedes the sun will outlast it in Revelation 22.5, where God will give light without the need for lamps or the sun. So does it matter if the God who can speak 93 billion light years of space into existence says, let there be light, and we don't know exactly scientifically what that means on day one? This is important because much has been made of whether the seven days of creation are literal days or whether they are figurative, whether they're ages or eons. I submit to you the answer this morning. I see a lot of excitement happening. The days of creation, whatever they are, are a literary framework. Their repetition in the first chapter of the Bible creates a pattern with a purpose. The pattern lends importance to the sequence of creation not the science of creation. And here the sequence is critical. Light spoken into being by God's word is good. Our fourth point, God defines what what is good. And God saw that the light was good, verse four, and he separated the light from the darkness. God is a seeing being. He sees everything. His gaze pierces the thickest darkness, the farthest star, the smallest particle, and pierces all hearts and motives.
When God sees light on earth, he declares it good. This phrase is repeated throughout Genesis 1, along with the day's structure. God saw that it was good. It's another literary framework occurring seven times along with days. And the purpose of this pattern is that God delights to make, and what he makes delights. What God calls good is the true good. God also separates the latter part of the verse, light from darkness. Light is that by which we see and are seen. Darkness prevents our seeing. In construction, an unlit worksite is a dangerous one, not just for health and safety reasons, but because the work will go awry if the light is not there to produce a verification of its truth. Similarly, God declares light good. In doing so, he defines in cosmic terms what the good and beautiful are, what things lead to truth, wholeness, integrity, and what things lie in shadow, darkness, and confusion. God makes and rules over time, our fifth point, our fifth verse. Verse 5, God called the light day and the darkness night. These things, these experiences, they now have a name, day and night. To name a thing is to exert power, authority, identity over it. We name our children with hope and intentions that the world will accept them in a certain way. There's power, identity, authority to a name. God names day and night. God names time. God owns time. He is over it. He has authority over it. It belongs to him. It originates from him, and yet he also works within it. I wouldn't dare force the deist view today with my words that God creates time and steps outside of it. That is absolutely not the case. He is working intimately within the framework he created to reveal himself to us, And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. And as that first day draws to a close, close the, it, the, the theological significance of that day is what stands. We could spend years and years and years discussing figurative or literal days, and theologians have, unfortunately. <laughs> but what's important is that God made everything. He made light. He defines what is good. He creates time, a structure, a framework in which he will reveal himself to us, in which we find out that there's a player deep in the lineup who's going to come and win the game on our behalf. Now, we've looked, haven't we? I've tried as much as possible to stick to the Old Testament. I really have. But Derek Kidner, again, the Cambridge scholar, says in his commentary, Genesis is, in various ways, almost nearer the New Testament than the Old. And some of its topics are barely heard again till their implications can fully emerge in the gospel. The institution of marriage, the fall of man, the jealousy of Cain, the judgment of the flood, the imputed righteousness of the believer, the rival sons of promise and of the flesh, the profanity of Esau, the pilgrim status of God's people, these are all predominantly New Testament themes. Finally, there is the symmetry by which some of the very scenes and figures of the earliest chapters of Genesis reappear in the book of Revelation, where Babel, Babylon, and that ancient serpent, the deceiver of the whole world, come to their downfall, and where the redeemed though they are now veterans rather than untried innocents, walk again in paradise by the river and tree of life. With that in mind, let me show you another famous prologue, and you'll hear immediately why it relates to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. That's Genesis 
John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And verse 14, we find out that this word is Jesus. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In this prologue of Genesis and in John's prologue, we see God talking in elevated prose. He is expanding our categories. Jesus in John 1, we're being told that Jesus was there. He was there in Genesis 1.1. In Genesis 1.3, all of these five verses. So let me take us through our five points again. This won't make the sermon twice as long, I promise. It's not a two hours traffic of our stage, right, that, that we're looking at. Um, our first point, God is all powerful and creative. And as we run through these points again, let us look at them in the light of John 1.1 1, 1 and other New Testament passages. Jesus was there. He was God's power and creativity. He was God's word, both personified and present. He was there already and created everything. We know this because Jesus prays in John 17, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Paul says in his letter to the Colossians, another fantastic prologue, that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. John and Paul's prologues have the elevated prose. They have the intention of both fact historical fact, and pulling back that curtain to glimpse the divine. God, through these two prologues, these three prologues, is telling us that even from the foundation of the world, he intended to recreate his creation, to make it new, to step into it, to step into the game, All things in Jesus are brought back together out of chaos and for good for those who believe in him. God's creative power is displayed in Jesus and it starts in our chaos. Our second point of man when God begins to deal with him in his grace, it is formless and empty of all good things. There is none righteous, no, not one says the book of James. Jesus is God's power for salvation, the power to be recreated in the image of God, to be set right from the chaos and formlessness that sin twists us into. 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The Greek literally says, if anyone is in Christ, new creation. It's emphatic about it. So how does this happen? Well, God creates light by speaking his word. Jesus, the word, both personified and present, he is the fulfillment of all the promises and prophecies of the Old Testament. As we continue to look in Genesis, we will see that Jesus is the seed that is promised. He's the star of David. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. 
the end of Genesis, prophesies that he will come throughout the Bible. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author and finisher of our faith, the Holy One of Israel, the image of God, the bread of heaven, the spotless lamb, the bright and morning star. Genesis 1 described God's creation of light, but when we look at it again, it points us to the true light of the world. John intentionally says, in him was life, and that life was the light of the world. And God defines what is good through Jesus. Colossians 1.19 says that it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, that is, in Christ. So when the Spirit descends upon Jesus at his baptism bodily in the form of a dove, what else could it have been? But, uh, you know, the, the, the bird, the mother bird hovering over the waters of chaos, the dove descends upon Jesus and we hear God say from heaven, this is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. Do you hear God echoing Genesis? He's saying, this is the ultimate good that I can give my creation. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do or with him to whom we must give account, says Hebrews 4, 13. The morning and evening of your life, the first day, it will eventually come to pass. We know this, we know deep within ourselves that death will come for us. But God has not abandoned his creation. Although he is not constrained by time, he chooses to constrain himself in love, to enter time, to send his son, born of a virgin. Yes, born of a virgin, bodily as a helpless infant. Jesus was crucified, died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. We say this in the creed. When the worst chaos and darkness come for us in life, God is telling us here in Genesis, here in John, in Colossians, all through his revealed word in Jesus, the King of Kings, that he can turn our darkness, our chaos, to light. Let me pray. Will you pray with me? Father, continue to pour your word into our hearts. Make us alive as we look at Genesis the rest of this term. Draw us to you in whatever doubts, hurts, fears, that we are experiencing whatever chaos is in our lives. Help us, Lord, to know that through Jesus, you can transform those things in our lives such that we will have no fear of what is to come, that we will ultimately know that you have won the game on our behalf and that that will transform our lives into a fullness and a richness that We've not imagined. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now uh, as the band comes up. Uh, all creatures of our God and King. And in verse 2, we see, Thou rushing wind, clouds that sail, the rising morn, lights of evening. Let us lift our eyes on this gorgeous day to the Creator. Amen.
Thank you, Juan, very much indeed. We heard, didn't we, that our creator God, he spoke into existence 93 billion light years of, you, of a universe. That's just, just unbelievable. But that same God loves us, uh, his creation, individually. Individually, he loves us. And through the Lord Jesus, he provides us salvation. I wonder how each one of us reacts to that. How do we respond to that? Perhaps these are things that you've not thought of very much or you're still uh, kind of exploring. We're running an Explored Christianity course uh, after the half term. If you'd uh, like to join that, maybe you'd like to refresh some of the things uh, that you've understood about uh, God and the Bible. Um, please speak to Josh, myself, or Juan after that. But another way that we can also respond to that is in prayer. And Simon Hainscroft will now uh, lead us in our prayers. Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to be praying for our missionary partners, the Andrew and Helen Curry and the Barnabas Fund. We're also going to be praying for those who are sick and unwell in our church, especially thinking of Heather and Monica. Then we're going to be praying for our children and our young people. And at the end of the prayers, we will be saying the collect and then the Lord's Prayer. So as I finish each prayer, would you please join me in a hearty amen. Lord Jesus, as the new day dawns, we arise with your spirit among us. We remember your resurrection morning and give you praise, for you are our Lord. We long to be with you on this day and thank you with our voices, our hearts, and our lives. Amen. Amen. Help us, Lord, to remember the simple things we sometimes take for granted, the beauty of your creation that surrounds us, the, the op op opportunities to love, live, and laugh, the mighty power of your Holy Spirit living and working in and through us. With the psalmist in Psalm 146, we say, we will praise the Lord all our lives. We will sing praise to our God as long as we live. And as long with the writer of Chronicles, we say, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love and mercy endures forever. Amen. Father God, we lift up our missionaries overseas, in particular Andrew and Helen Curry and their children, Thomas and Esther. Lord, you have called them away from their homeland to follow you for your purpose in their lives and into the lives of those they come into contact with. Just as Hebrews 11.8 reminds us Abraham, of Abraham going by obedience and not knowing where he would find on the journey ahead, overseas missionaries like Helen and Curry are very much like Abraham. They've woken to the call of, of, of their own hearts to venture beyond here and to serve you. Lord, we do pray for them. We uplift them before you. And at the same time, we think of our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. We thank you for the Barnabas Fund. Help them, we pray, with their much-needed work in supporting our persecuted brothers and sisters. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus, when you were on earth, you healed those who were sick and cared for those who were suffering or grieving. We pray for those in our church family and in our own families who are unwell. And we pray for Heather as she recovers from her stroke. May all the care needed for her return home be provided. Please give her daughter Rosemary strength and wisdom as she continually travels down from Sheffield to, give Heather's, to sort Heather's care. We also pray for Monica. Please uplift her as she recovers. Help her to remain positive and that her oncologist will provide a fitting recovery plan for her. We long to see Monica soon here at church. But in the meantime, Lord, keep her strong. Keep her faithful. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord God, we pray for our children and our young people. As they move into the summer school term, be with those taking their exams. Give them retentive minds as they revise, but may they also meditate and find joy in your word. 
Be with those that are making the leap from infant school to junior school, from junior school to senior school, from senior school to university, and from university to work. Help them hold fast to their faith and help them to encounter new challenges by your Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, at the bottom of the, uh, the sorry, at the top of the pa third page, we join together in today's collect. Together we say, Almighty Father, you gave your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant that we may put away the old leaven of malice and wickedness and serve you in purity and for truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us as we sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Simon, for those prayers. Well, we now turn to our uh, last hymn, uh, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Joy of heaven to earth come down. Please stand when the music starts.
Well, our formal part of the service uh, is now over, but do stay for a, a coffee and chat about what we've heard today. But let's close our meeting by saying uh, the words of the grace to each other. They're printed on uh, page three at the bottom. We say together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.